Hey everybody, I'm Ashley Graham, and this is Pretty Big Deal, where confidence is key. Every episode, I get to pick the brains of brilliant, inspiring, honest, new and old friends who are a pretty big deal. Today, we are talking to a force to be reckoned with, Sophia Bush. Sophia is an actress, activist, and host of the Work in Progress podcast. She's an outspoken change agent taking on the entertainment industry and the world at large. What you can put your feet up if you want. Okay. Well, I mean, if you want. Really? If you want. Yeah. No, seriously, if you want. In my shoes? Or you could t- whatever you want. You can take them off. Who cares? Look, you got a cute pedicure. Yeah, not bad. <laughs> I just like, I have this creepy person on Twitter who likes to message me. Um, About your feet? Pictures of my own feet, which is weird. So now I'm like sort of self-conscious about my feet being out. I totally get it because you know. there's weird people on Instagram that post my feet. And I'm like, yeah. but what is it? Because like, I don't have like a particularly special foot. It's I mean, just like- have cute feet. No, it's just like kind of like a brick. <laughs> But that wasn't they the work. adjective that came to mind. <laughs> Are your feet swollen because a little you're pregnant? Bit. Oh my gosh, we, I just had a pair of shoes on and like the strap was very tight across. And mm. I think last week it wasn't as tight. Mm. It's the things that happen. Crazy. Just wait, you'll see. I mean, okay. <laughs> I'm game. Oh my gosh, thank you for being on Pretty Big Deal. Thank you for having me. Hi. I was just saying backstage how it's, I'm always so happy when I see you at things. Oh. Because, you know, events are weird. And I don't know if you feel that, but I still have so much anxiety in those rooms where I'm just like, what's going on here? What is everybody doing? And ah, and you're always one of those people who I'm like, hi. <sighs> well, we have so much to talk about. We do. You're doing a lot of things. A lot of things, yeah. And you have a lot of activism going on, which I'm just like, she doesn't care what anybody says. Uh-uh. She doesn't care what you think. She's going to speak her mind. Yeah. And I want to talk about that. And I want to get into that. But first, it all began in North Carolina. It did. On the set of One Tree Hill. Yeah. Wow. What was that like? Because you were, here you are, you're playing Brooke. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you're like morphing into kind of the woman you are today. But I want yeah. to talk about that whole process. All of this is so strange. You know, the the world of, I, I think the world of making things is incredible. And I think the things that come with it can be a little bit bizarre. And, you know, I was a journalism student at USC going on auditions and driving my poor team crazy because I would say, you know, I can work on spring break or, or in the summer. And I remember my agent at the time saying, you can't treat your career like an extracurricular activity. But... <laughs> I was a kid, I was a student, so to me it was an extracurricular activity. And then I booked this full-time job and had to, in the span of, I think it was three weeks, Mm -hmm. pick up and move across the country. And I'm from LA, I'm born and raised here. So it was really weird for me. It's a little bit of a culture shock. Yeah, and it was also, and look, it's not to say that there are not problems here in this city, there are problems for people everywhere, but in this sort of state of blissful unawareness that I experienced when I was, how old was I? I don't know, 20, 21. I looked at LA as this really fun melting pot and everybody kind of runs into everybody. Mm -hmm. And I got to this little town in the South and I was like, oh, people here are racist as fuck. There was all this stuff that I'd never experienced before. And and there were these weird phrases that these kind of like good old boy Southern dudes would say and the way that they would talk to me as a young woman and, and, and the really intense sort of segregation of that space felt really shocking to me. And obviously in the last 15 years of really diving into advocacy, I've learned so much about the systems that make those things the mm-hmm. way they are. But at the time I remember just the culture shock. So not only was it the moving, then you're on a set 16, 18 hours a day you have to be a professional. You're, you know, you're in an environment kind of like this. There's 200 people working, you know, on the other sides of the cameras, and we were all 21. Right. We were like so excited we could actually <laughs> legally order beer. Like we had no <laughs> idea what we were doing, and we were responsible for a television series and for people's jobs, and it was it was wild. Jeez, yeah. but it was like you you li- literally left LA and you came into this whole new world, yeah. but you could feel the difference. And do you feel like feeling the difference made you want to bring more of 
who Sophia is into Brooke's character? Yeah, for sure. I brought a lot you to did. her. I fought a lot with the writers. Um, I was luckily, I was sort of unaware of, of the power dynamics at play, and I would just say things. I'd be like, I'm not doing this. Stop really? writing scenes. Oh, yeah. They, there was this sort of really weird thing. Um, I mean, you look back at it. At the time, I didn't realize how inappropriate it was, but again, this is a long time ago. I remember my boss kept writing scenes for me to be in my underwear, and I was like, I'm not doing this, this is inappropriate. Like, I don't think this is what we should be teaching 16 year old girls to be doing and to be seeking validation this way. And he was like, well, you're not 16. And I said, but I'm playing 16. And if you want somebody to do it so badly, like get somebody else to do it. And he literally said to me, he goes, well, you're the one with the big fucking rack everybody wants to see. And I was like, what? <laughs> well, I'm not doing it. And I remember I showed up in the next episode in a turtleneck just oh. sort of to be spiteful. I was like, this is just how I'm gonna dress oh. um, on the show from now on if you don't stop writing these scenes. I was really ballsy and I didn't even know it. I just wasn't wanting to perpetuate this sort of behavior that I didn't think was appropriate. So that was sort of on the serious, like that was me, Joan of Arking. And then there was also this catchphrase that Brooke Davis had where she'd bounce up to people and go, hi friend. And I <laughs> put that in the show because my College roommate Allie and I used to say that to each other, <laughs> like on, on the USC campus. We'd run up to each other and go, hi, friend. And so it became Brooke's catchphrase. I was like, thank you. I deserve a writing credit. For that. <laughs> so yeah. you really did see a lot of yourself in your character. Yeah, I really struggled to relate to so many things about her that I had to do so much work to feel like I could play her. Mm. And something about that over the nine years we did the show brought us closer and closer together. But yeah, there were ways that she would behave and things that she would say and things that she would do that I was like, I don't know if I could ever. But in some ways we were really similar. So interesting. How do you prepare yeah. for a role like that? I'm not an actress yeah. in any way, shape or form. I'm really good at being myself. And like, you know, I've got my goofy self, my serious self, you know, yeah. all those things, but it's always me. I can't yeah. imagine being someone else and portraying that. How do you prepare? It is, it's so weird because it's become so second nature to me that it's hard for me to think about how I do it. Really? But I always Come on, Meryl Streep us, come on. Oh my God, I mean, please, can Meryl Streep, <laughs> Meryl Streep me? I'm like, if I there was, that. if there was like a, a chart in, in, by which you could follow and then act like Meryl Streep, right? we would all be Academy Award winners. Um, she is everything. I've she just is. started like getting hot in the face thinking about how much I love her. It's fine. Big Little Lies, like I never hated someone as much she as I hated her character. incredible. I know. I know. She made my skin crawl and also I just wanted to hang out with her and like figure out why she behaved <sighs> that way. Anyways, preparing that, for roles. That's really it, is you have to figure out why someone behaves a certain way. Mm. And you have to figure out, for me at least, my process is always, what am I really saying? Because if you and I are shooting a conversation that's scripted and you ask me, ask me, how are you? How are you? I'm fine. You're like, oh, that person's not fine. But ask me, how are you? How are you? I'm great. <laughs> like those are two and, and the second version of that is I have so many things to tell you. I'm so excited. And like, I met someone who's amazing. And, you know, that could be the character's motivation. But someone who's really struggling, when they say like, I'm fine. And Ooh, you and go, your nostrils Ooh. flared a little bit too. Did they? Yeah. They do that. And there's also someone on Twitter who like constantly what? hates on me because my oh nostrils my flare when I cry. And I'm like, cool, because I can control the musculature of my face for you. I hate Twitter sometimes. No, I know. But that's the thing is I always <laughs> think about what's going on under the words yeah. so that the words have more meaning than just the lines of dialogue. That's interesting. That's usually where I It's start. definitely case by case, obviously. Yeah. Sophia, this conversation is so good, but just give me two seconds. If there's one thing I love more than shopping, it's saving. Online shopping is supposed to be easy, but it can almost be impossible to find valid coupons. And that is where Honey comes in. Honey is a free online shopping tool that automatically finds the best promo codes and applies them to your cart. I've been shopping like crazy for the baby and Honey has helped me save more money than I can count. Last week, I saved almost $40 on a baby monitor that I know I'm just gonna be obsessed with. Saving on high quality must have items is a no brainer, especially when it's big life changes on the way. Honey supports over 30,000 stores and counting. Look, not using Honey is like literally passing up free money. It's free to use and installs in just two 
clicks. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash pretty big deal. That's joinhoney.com slash pretty big deal. Now let's get back to pretty big deal. So how have you used a vehicle of change in walking into this new era of Sophia Bush? I think it's interesting. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, you know, in the last couple of years uh, or since the election, like you've really jumped into activism. And I thought, isn't it funny how what we've been doing for so long only really permeates when it does? Mm. You know, I remember Naomi Watts talking about when she uh, booked The Ring. Mm. And, you know, she became this mega movie star. And someone said, like, overnight success. And she was like, I've been going on auditions for 12 years and I used to live in my car. Seriously. You know, I've been in the space of, of advocacy for so long. But for me, the deeper and deeper I get into it, the more and more I want to do. Right. And I think there was a period when One Tree Hill was first on, the kind of attention and tabloid culture and double standard for women and all this weird stuff I was experiencing was just so ugly that it made me not want to be out there any more than mm. I was being forced to be mm. or, or even being put out in pages of things against my will in certain ways. Right. And then what I realized, I was working with this amazing environmental advocacy group for a long time and I realized that sort of showing up but not really being proactive in ways to speak up besides when I was in the room was actually silencing my voice mm. and wasn't using my platform to the best of my ability and then I was like oh fuck this like that was a Brooke Davis moment where I was like I'm gonna burn it down <laughs> um, and that really changed everything for me starting to really figure out ways to use the privilege of a platform to offer windows into the access that I had. Mm. Because I go to all of these incredible conferences. And this is since way back in the day, before the conference circuit was a thing. Right. I was just going to conferences and people, <laughs> and friends now make fun of me. And they're like, oh my God, when we were in our early 20s and you would be like there with a notebook, we were like, why is that girl from TV so weird? <laughs> She was, they were like, you would just be in the front, like taking notes and drawing diagrams, and I still do. But everyone was like, are you okay? Why aren't you at a Golden Globes party? And I was like, I'm just learning about ocean science here at this thing. So in a way, it's allowed me to remain a student. And the depth that I choose to go in, in the learning and in the data and, and in social science research and in looking at these big sort of inherited systems, whether they're systems of oppression for women or systems mm -hmm. of oppression for people of color or systems of oppression for the environment, mm -hmm. that learning feels like such a responsibility, such a privilege, and, and really is the thing that fulfills me as a person. Mm. Because my job fulfills me in the bucket of my career. I right. love to tell stories. Your career, as you know, it's such a small part of who you are. It really is. It's just is. the thing that you do. That's why we do things like this. Yeah. So this is the stuff that I that fuels love you. Love and that fuels me. I love that. Where did you get the conviction to say, "I'm going to put my mark in this world"? I think honestly, I've just been so mad mm. and motivated. It's not like negative, but I actually think my. But what made you so mad? I don't know. I mean, my here mom... you are. You're like you. I mean, can I say it? Like yeah. you're white. You're privileged. Yeah. You're in Hollywood. Yeah. Like, but what was it that hit so home for you? My mom says that my family called me Joan of Arc in the cradle. I have always been really on fire about defending people or places that deserve protection and don't get it. And I think that a big part of my learning has been learning how to channel sacred rage. I think we all have it. Glennon mm. Doyle mm. talks about that term a lot. Like, what is that thing that lights that fire inside of you? And I don't think that that kind of rage, sacred rage or being mad about something, I don't think that's bad. No. I think that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, that for me equates to passion. And so the things that made me so mad, historically, when I would really get underneath them, when I would look at environmental devastation, I would look at how it affects communities, in particular low-income communities, communities of color and women. Mm -hmm. When you look at disparity in the education system, who does it affect? All the same people. Mm -hmm. When you look, And it's like I came into the world in a certain level of privilege, but I understand the oppression I've experienced as a woman mm -hmm. in this world, as mm -hmm. a sensitive person in this world. And I know how shit it's been for me. And the idea that my friend is going to get it worse mm -hmm. because 
she wasn't born white. That makes me enraged. I'm like, this shit is already hard enough Seriously. without all of these other things happening to people. And, and I think it's strange when the world has behaved in a way that tells us, well, it's not your problem. Right. Your problem is my problem. Right. Our liberty is bound together. It's just this, not everybody thinks that way. Sure, but then I'm like, do some research. Right. <laughs> like, read a book. I'll give you a Educate whole book yourself. list. Like, there's a place to go. What I think is beautiful in the dumpster fire that is our current political landscape is at least that people are waking up to the reality that this sort of white, cisgendered, heteronormative patriarchy has nothing for them. People everywhere are suffering, and it's our job to take up space and demand change. That's what, a great answer. What no. else are we supposed to be doing, you know? I mean, I think that you've just you've just educated yourself so well throughout all of it that it's like, how can you not listen? How can you stand back mm -hmm. and not use your voice? Who inspires you? Oh my gosh, so many people. Some of my closest friends, I, I'm so tremendously inspired by. My best friend Nia, my best friend Babs. Wow, it's like the people closest to you. Yeah, the people closest to me are a well of inspiration for me. And then I look around the world, you know, I look at my friend Glennon and what she's doing with her platform as a writer and with her wife, Abby, and, and, the, and the firestorm that Abby helped to start, you know, winning the last World Cup and, mm. and beginning to pave the way for our current soccer stars, you know, the Megan Rapinos and Alex Morgans and the Ashlyn Harris's. It's like what those women are doing with their mantle and the, and the friendships we've all built out of this activist space. Right. I'm endlessly inspired by them. I'm endlessly inspired by my friend Brittany Packnett, who is a former educator and a teacher on race and inclusivity and a public speaker and is about to have her first book come out. And like, she is a lifeline for me, you know? And then of course it's like, I don't know, who's not inspired by Oprah and Michelle Obama. Yeah. And, and even looking at, you know, what Chelsea Handler's up to in the world. You know, yes. she has this big successful comedy career. She doesn't need to do any work for anybody. And she woke up and was like, I have all this privilege and how do I change that? Right. And you know, went out and, wrote a book about exposing a mental health crisis and codependency and looking at race. And everybody, no matter what stage they're at in their lives, has the opportunity to create more change now than they might have created before. I'm glad you said that because I think there's a lot of young people who are super overwhelmed with how mm -hmm. to and what to do. Mm -hmm. And I want to propose the question to you is like, what can those young people do that are feeling overwhelmed yeah. in society that we're living in today? Society's overwhelming. From the position that people like us sit in, where a lot of young people, and I'm sure you experience this with the people who follow you, because you know I comment on all your things, which means I see other people's You're comments. So I'm always cute. like, yes, get it. <laughs> I'm screaming at you on Instagram, just like clapping. <laughs> you know, young people look at people like you, people like me, and they go, well, when I get there, I then won't I'll feel have a like voice. this. When I get there, I'll have I a won't voice. feel, and I won't feel bad. Yeah. I won't feel depressed. I'll I wake up feel, feeling yeah. great. And it's like, I've never, there will never be it's a point that. where you wake up and you're just like, oh my God, from today forward, I'm amazing forever. Right. That doesn't happen. And I think for us, it has to be about sharing the skills and the ways that we cope with overwhelm and the ways that we figure out how to channel our sacred rage and the ways that we figure out how to show up and speak up when needed and shut up and learn when needed. Yeah. And that is a big lesson that young people need to learn. Yeah. <laughs> to just understand that their voice will be heard in time, but to listen in yeah. the meantime. And I think it's really about doing both. You know, we need them to be so young and bold. Well, that's right, actually, because there's the young environmentalist Greta. Mm -hmm. I mean, jeez. Yeah. I think I teared up a few times yeah. in some of her speeches. I mean, there's so much change that she's mm -hmm. creating. So we you're need, right. We need her idealism and we need her fight. But again, she chooses to learn. Mm -hmm. She's chosen to educate herself. When you look at all of the kids from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and what mm -hmm. they've done with March for Our Lives, mm -hmm. They're out there causing mass change, but they're also sitting at the feet of experts and learning. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that all of us learn how to really put ourselves out there and also really learn from people who can teach us. Because if you do all of one or all of the other, we're not gonna progress. Yeah, um, so no, that's I think, good advice. I think for young people, it's follow people you trust. Unfollow everyone who makes you feel bad about yourself. Yes. Like you don't have to follow people who give you that horrible comparison plague. Yeah. 
comparison is the thief of joy. It ruins everything. Oh, I like that. And this is another thing that my friend Glennon says, is don't compare your insides to somebody else's outsides. Yes. Because however you're feeling in here and then you're looking through your phone, you assume nobody else could be feeling what you feel. Yes. And so what I want for young people is for them to know how valuable they are, how powerful they already are, and that your power really only can be executed upon when you educate yourself and you show up from a place of, of prioritizing the community over the self. Prioritizing the community over yourself. Mm -hmm. Wow, Sophia Bush, you got so many like tweetable, quotable Thanks. moments. I appreciate Living that. Living a lot. I appreciate that. So you've had a lot of experience in front of the camera, behind the camera, yeah. and I want to talk to you about your goals now walking into directing and producing. Yeah. What are you doing? Oh, it's such a wild experience. Um, I started directing actually in the last couple of seasons of One Tree Hill because our show was on for so long that I wanted new challenges. Did you say, hey, I want to direct? And yeah. they said, okay? Yeah. Oh, that's great. It was cool. And I had been tagging along to production meetings and, and budget meetings and listening to notes calls. And again, you kind of have to show up. You have to prove your value before you ask for value. That's mm -hmm. another thing that's important for young mm. people to learn. I really w made it clear that I wanted to do it. And I worked really closely with you know my camera department and my producing director on set. and. I had such a good experience. There's always more to learn. And so now getting into this space where I'm looking at things I might want to go direct, like what show do I want to mm -hmm. show up on for two weeks and do that, and developing projects. And it's weird because, you know, this, this creative universe that we work in holds no guarantees. And there mm -hmm. are some things where I'm like, this is the best idea ever. This will be the best show ever. And someone's like, there's just not really a market for that because somebody <sighs> tried that three years ago and it failed and now everyone's afraid. Yeah. And I'm like, well, stop being afraid. I'm not afraid. Right. You know, but then you go, okay. Someone so give me a chance. So then I'll bring in the other idea. And so the back end that nobody sees is the number of se sessions with writers and production meetings and meetings at studios and meetings with development heads. And it's a slog to figure out which thing you will eventually be able to make into a project someone mm -hmm. will see. But I also really love it. <laughs> like, I love it. And it's like documentary series and comedies. And there's a book that I just optioned the rights to to adapt to make a biopic as a feature. And there's so much stuff. Yeah. But who knows what it'll be yet? I don't know. All right, just hold that thought. Isn't it crazy how hard it is to just plan a celebration of love? Zola makes wedding planning easier and less stressful with wedding websites, registries, invites, and a guest list manager all in one place. They even have hundreds of free website designs to choose from. Zola is the highest rated registry of all time. Plus they have beautiful and affordable invites and paper for your wedding. They'll even help you collect addresses and track online RSVPs with their free guest list manager. Zola has helped over 1 million couples get married and they'll help you too. So go to Zola.com slash pretty big deal today and use promo code save 50 to get 50% off your save the dates. And you can also get a free personalized paper sample before you purchase. That's 50% off save the dates at Zola.com slash pretty big deal, promo code save 50. Now let's get back to my show. All right, let's dive back in. It's clear that you are on this mission to create change mm. wherever you go. Mm. What do you do when you feel like your voice isn't being heard? Oh, that can be so just detrimental for all of us. Mm -hmm. And I've been in a lot of places where I don't think that my voice was heard or maybe respected. Mm. And again, for me, the thing that I rest on is being hyper-educated in the room. Mm. Because you get hard to ignore if you're speaking the truth and you're mm. speaking facts. You're hard to ignore if you know how to back up an argument. My dad, oh yeah, my dad is like, I can't believe you didn't wind up being a lawyer. And I'm like, maybe I will be. Who knows? <laughs> I was just about to say, you always could be. I could be. And I think having a community that you trust, because mm -hmm. we've all been in positions where we've been disrespected, you know, in the workplace. And I think having people that you can go to is really important. And if you want to have people you can go to, you need to be the kind of person people can come to. So what happened in your experience with Chicago PD? Yeah, it was bad. You weren't respected in that, mm -mm. in the scenario, really and then bad. even when you left. Yeah, it was really rough. 
And it's interesting. Can you tell everybody at home what had happened? I was going through my own personal, like, me too hell at work. Mm. And I spent a year working on getting off that show. You spent a whole year trying to get off of the show? Uh Because you, as an actor, you sign a six-year contract. So your network and your show essentially own you. Uh, And I left after four years. I had to get out of my contract two years early. I left, it was April of that year, and the whole Harvey story broke in July. So I was fighting this battle with no cultural conversation about this in the industry. Wow, and just a few months later. Yeah, it was really interesting. And I think about it, and I'm like, man, there's some people on that set who are just like breathing a sigh of relief, uh, which is unfortunate. But it's been a weird thing because you realize how quickly, if you stand up for yourself, you can become the enemy. Yeah. And for whatever reason, the men who behave in these ways get branded as old school or, you know, difficult or yeah. of a different Yeah, and they time. always are given a second chance. Uh-huh. For me, my experience was that in standing up for myself, I got listened to for a moment, and then it was clear that I wasn't going to back down about mm. it. Mm. And then I Oof. became the enemy. You're the problem. Uh-huh. You're the troublemaker. Uh-huh. And I thought, wow, it's so interesting that in speaking what has happened to me, I'm a troublemaker rather than the person who has put me through this. Oh my gosh. It's a weird thing. And that's why I think we have a lot of work left to do. People say, well, hasn't Me Too right. changed everything? And I've said, no, it's changed the conversation. Mm-hmm. But until we start actually punishing perpetrators and not victims, it's it's all versions of what were you wearing, mm. you know? I wanted to ask you, like, what else do we need to do? Because just that line alone of we still have so much more to go, mm-hmm. what can we be doing right now in the Me Too movement? And then yeah. I want to also ask the question, what can men be doing? Well, I think men need to be better advocates and allies. You know, it came to me through the grapevine not long ago that some of the men who I worked with on that job have been voicing their irritation that I speak as frankly about what I went through there as I do. And I think, wow, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. What I need is for one of you guys to say something. Mm -hmm. What I need is for one of you to say, yeah, she has to keep talking about it because nobody's doing anything about it. Nobody's doing anything about it. And we feel for her, not why won't she keep her mouth shut. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's not my responsibility. So men speak up. Yeah, we need them to speak up. And I think we also need men to be better allies in the moment because. Mm. Everyone's trying to be good employees and everyone's trying to get to the end of the day. And people forget, again, that there are 200 people on a set and on a crew. A lot of people's livelihoods and their kids' school tuition and their mortgages depend on this job. And so everybody's trying to get to the end of the day. But what I think would be really helpful is if in a room when a guy says something abhorrent, inappropriate, and actually illegal— to his female coworker, it's one thing for us to be like, don't talk to me like that. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, ooh, she can't take a joke. It's another thing if a guy goes, hey, don't talk to her like that. Exactly. That's just not appropriate. Men react so much differently when another man says, we're not men who do that. (sighs) And whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is irrelevant. It's true. And we need men to show up for us in that way. We really do. You know? There was a time on set where I had a guy, you know, lead me into a closet and he pulled out himself and he was like, touch it, you know, and it was like this whole moment. I'm 18. I'm a model. There's not much more I can do. And these situations happen all the time, Uh right? All the time. Uh And I didn't say anything because I didn't want to be the troublemaker Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to cause issues on set. And you spoke up. Do you feel like it hurt where you thought you wanted to go with your with with your career? Yeah, I mean, look, I all I had ever wanted to do was work on a Dick Wolf show. And by the way, Dick Wolf is the best. I've said this and I'll say it until I the day I die. He's amazing and he was a great boss and he was my fiercest protector. He found out what was going on and here's what's interesting, you realize that the infrastructure of a system is so big and everyone's so afraid to rock the boat. Mm -hmm. They hide things. Mm. They go, this is below his pay grade. When he finally found out what was going on, he rode into town like a knight. It was incredible. He read a riot act that like would have made your skin peel off if you were on the receiving end of it. Wow. 
But the thing is, Dick Wolf runs, I don't know, nine shows, is right. writing four books, is doing a true crime series, making movies. He's not on set all the time. He right. like he comes sometimes. Our set was never better than when he was on set. And he also was the person when I was told I wasn't gonna be allowed to leave this environment that was so toxic to me, was like, absolutely not, she gets to go. Wow. Like So that was like a man who stood yes, up. Yes, he's an ally. And you know, he was the guy who was like, you're my next Mariska, like well, let's do this for 20 years. And I was like, let's fucking go. I gave that up because it was unsustainable for me to go to work anymore. Mm -hmm. You can't heal from toxic behavior in the toxic environment. You mm -hmm. just can't do it. Mm -hmm. And in the last two years, the number of you know survivors of both assault and harassment and targeted harassment and chronic harassment that I've spoken to, everyone shares this experience that you don't begin to heal until you start speaking your story and you don't begin to heal until you get out of the environment that is making you sick. Two hard things to come to a realization. Yeah. yeah. And so to your point, it was a giving up of a real career opportunity, but I mm. had to prioritize my life mm -hmm. over my job mm. at that point. Whew, it's heavy. Yeah, but also okay. You feel good. I really do. You got out of that toxic environment. I did, and, and I still have such deep relationships there. Like. Mm. I'm so tight with my camera crew and I get pictures of everyone's babies and my Aww. focus puller on that show came over and helped me plant all my fruit trees at my house because oh. he and his wife grow avocados and stone fruits at their place. That's so cool. And like literally he came over and helped me set up my garden and you know, they're my, that, that crew is still my family. Wow. My friends from that show are still my friends. So it's, it's bittersweet in a way, but the stuff that lasts, lasts. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, sometimes if you're full up with something, you don't have space for something new. And it was a little scary to take a leap, but I made space for newness that is really exciting. It is exciting. Yeah. Work in progress. <laughs> One of the things I made space for. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited for this podcast. Thank you. So you're a new host. Yeah. Work in progress. Yeah. Where was the birth of work in progress? Many years ago, I got asked what advice I would give, you know, to my younger self or to women. And it's funny because sometimes I think in the way that I have a heart for others, I can offer the advice that I need to hear. <laughs> Oh, I hear you on that, Don't especially going through all this. I can't even imagine. Oh, my God. You're like running your own corporation and growing a human at the same time. Yes, but then also having to like remind myself, like I tell women to embrace every single curve mm -hmm. and now I've got a big old curve that I'm trying to embrace and it's like, right. whoa, Nelly. Yeah, you're like, oh, the universe wants me to practice what I preach. Yeah. yeah, so I feel like that's what work in progress is about. Yeah, a little bit. And for me, I said something that has just really resonated with people and I said, you are allowed to be both a masterpiece and a work in progress simultaneously. Because mm. I think so many of us get so focused on the goal. Like eventually when I'm the masterpiece, I will feel right. that we miss the present. Right. But if we're just too in the present and we don't goal set, what are we really working on? And so I was trying to talk about that balance and I realized, like we talked about earlier, that so many people look at other people and think they have it all figured out and they don't know that we're all a work in progress. Right. And so I'm interviewing all of these incredible people who I find to be so inspiring and so funny and so smart and so accomplished and getting into their story and getting into how they show up in the world and what they're learning and what they're still working on. Yes, that's one of the questions that you ask your guests. What yeah. is the exact question? I always ask them at the end and I explain why and I just say, so when I ask you what in your life feels like a work in progress, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Oh, I'm glad I got like the, the question before I'm there because yeah. I'm going to think about it. No, but I'll, say, I'll still get you. I'll get you so far on like in one other direction. Is, does something come up though when I ask you that now? I think that knowing that there's no such thing as balance and mm. I've always been a yes girl, ambitious, and I've never put my career second fiddle or my relationship second fiddle. Like I've tried to do everything all the time. Mm. But now that I'm about to be a mom, I have to figure all that out because what I've realized is there's no such thing as balance. Mm. And there's oh so much of 
that whole world that I don't know yet. So Mm -hmm. it's like a whole new unknown that I'm a little bit nervous about. Yeah. But it's a work in progress. Yeah. And I'm not afraid of it. I've really not been afraid of most things that have come my way. It's great. I can't wait to come on your podcast and talk about it. I know. I can't wait to have you. It's going to be so fun. (laughs) What do you think that there's some things in your life that you're working on? What is a work in progress in Sophia's life? Oh, your point about balance. That's that's a real thing. Because I don't know what balance looks like. I, I don't think there is such thing as balance. Yeah. And maybe there isn't. I think that for me, I'm interested in so many things. And figuring out what to prioritize is really a work in progress for mm-hmm. me. I've been so in this activist and, and journalism kind of based space, which I love. Mm-hmm. And now I'm like, oh, I also need to figure out, like, what is the next show I want to do? I haven't really been looking at that. I've been developing some things, but which of those things do I want to get behind? I have to make a decision there. And... At some point, I need to figure out how to carve out the time and space to be in a relationship with someone. Mm. I've, in a very good and healthy way, been in relationship with myself for a minute. That's been really important for me. And now I'm finally, I do you ever, I mean, you're married and your husband is a bun, by the way. When I <laughs> met him at whatever that, we were at like some weird place in New York, some like apartment that wasn't really someone's apartment for oh, a dinner. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was beautiful, but it I was, was like, whose house are we in? It, it was wasn't bizarre. anyone's house. Yeah. Anyway. And he was just an angel. But I really, (laughs) I've realized, and and I don't know if you had this when you were, you know, meeting him, but for a while, I feel like I haven't even really seen people. And Mm. just recently, I'm like, oh, people are cute. (laughs) Like, people in the world are good looking. I think maybe I want to go on a date with one of these good looking people. It's like I didn't even notice anyone for a while. I was so in my own space. And now I'm like, Oh, I could like maybe have a crush on someone. That would be fun. Well, you heard it here, ladies and yeah. gentlemen. Sophia Bush is looking. So like, I don't know. We'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not not open to it. Anymore. Okay. You know what I mean? That's great. Yeah. That's good. Open for love. But like, I just wish there were more hours in a day. Wait, hold on. Last question. Do you have non-negotiables? Mm-hmm. Give me okay. some examples. Okay, so make sure tonight, like if you really truly are open yeah. to this whole idea of like going on a date, yeah. dating, falling in love. Did you make a list before you met your I husband? I made a list, girlfriend. Stop. I made a list. I wrote it physically down. I wrote who I wanted in a husband and what my non-negotiables were. What were they? Wait, will some you share? Of them, Is that okay? No, it's okay. Some okay. of them were like, I needed him to have the same faith as me okay. because that was important. I needed him to have not just a job, but a career where he was ambitious. Yep. He needed to make me laugh because yeah. laughter is huge. Yeah. And I needed a friend, like a friend friend. Yeah. There was a couple more things. But yeah, those are like the top level. I mm-hmm. love that. Mm-hmm. Laughter is Non-negotiable. Big. Yeah. You'll do it. Yeah. I'm excited for you. That's fun. Thank you a for list. being on. I'm so excited to just continue to watch you soar and mm. to create lanes for people and give a Thanks. voice to young women who feel like they don't have one. So thank you mm. for doing that. Thank you for educating us on everything that you know, because you're a thank plethora you. of knowledge. Oh, thanks. And you're beautiful. That's kind. <laughs> Hello, coming from you. You are. But thank one you. last thing that we do on Pretty Big Deal yeah. before I allow my guests to leave. <gasps> is you just have to answer a few questions. It's our live boldly lightning round. I like the lightning round. Okay. okay. What's the last pretty penny you spent? I mean, I'm renovating my house right now. Oh, gosh. That so, is like, so expensive. It's, and oh, it's, and whatever they tell you it is, no, it's, it's double, more. Maybe triple. And it's traumatizing. Yes. But the the tile is going in in the bathroom right now, and it's so pretty. So I feel like I've spent a pretty penny on tile, and I'm okay, not mad about it. Okay, it's tile. I can't mm-hmm. wait to see it. Yeah. What's your biggest deal breaker? My biggest deal breaker? Willful ignorance. Mmm. Mmm. I haven't heard that one yet. When I encounter someone who has access to the information and chooses to say it isn't true anyway because that's more convenient to their existence, that's a deal breaker for me. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, that's deep. Mm-hmm. Because you're a pretty big deal. And I only have pretty <laughs> big deals on my show. Oh, okay. I want to know what's a pretty big deal to you. I mean, <laughs> the constant threat to our national security. That we're talking about. <laughs> no, I don't want to be that morbid. I'm sorry. Um, a pretty big <laughs> deal. But that is the that yeah. thing that makes me not sleep. A pretty big deal to me. You know what I'm really excited about? 
Uh, Reese Witherspoon and Jen Aniston have this new show coming out on Apple, The Morning Show, and as a person whose favorite TV show growing up was Murphy Brown, I literally can't wait. And I haven't even seen a preview. I know nothing about- Oh, you haven't seen the preview? No, I I don't want to watch any, I don't want to know anything. I just want to go in. And so I'm really excited about it. And one other thing comes to mind that feels important, and it's actually a, a company that I joined the advisory board of because looking at this whole space of post Me Too breaking and how we report and how we make workplaces safer, there's a bit of a conflict of interest that companies have their own HR departments Mm. because then HR works for the company and not for the employees. Mm. And a group of incredible women in tech, including one of the female engineers who had been harassed at a big tech company, got together and created a platform called All Voices. Mm. And companies can onboard the service, but it's a third party completely anonymized reporting line and they give companies the actual bottom line of what's going on under their roof wow. but they as a third party can hold the company accountable that sounds like a pretty big deal it's pretty incredible and so to see um imagine entertainment of course because ron howard is also a bun uh it was like the first movie studio that signed up to be on the platform and there's a whole bunch of companies that have onboarded it and essentially i'm just helping them story tell about how it works because I see the need for this firsthand. Right. And it makes me excited that a bunch of like badass female engineers and women in tech are gonna help us solve this problem. So um, I think All Voices is a pretty big deal. All Voices, you heard yeah. it here. That's great. Thank yeah. you, Sophia, for being on. I really appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Girl. It's my burst of love to you. I'll take it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Pretty Big Deal with Sophia Bosch. I hope you guys gained some knowledge because I certainly did as well. And you can catch this episode of Pretty Big Deal with Sophia Bush anywhere and everywhere you listen to podcasts.